Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining today. I'm Jamie, and I want to welcome you to the Interface uh, webinar today, Dimensions of Multi-Axis Sensors. This event is being broadcast to uh, participants all over the world, so we want to thank you for joining the conversation. And today we have a few of our experts on hand to address some of the questions that we get about a growing technology and some of the use cases. So thanks again for joining. And just to give you an outline of what we'll be talking about today, our agenda is going to start with some of the introduction on features of multi-axis sensors and why people are choosing this type of sensor in test and measurement. We'll go over some of the product specifications and applications and use cases, address common FAQs that we get here at Interface, and then, of course, give an opportunity to answer any questions that you may have. As noted, when you enter into the conference, your meeting uh, microphone will be off. However, if you do have a question, you can unmute yourself or you can simply use the chat feature. Today we have presenters uh, from Interface. Ken Bishop, who as well as Brian Peters and Keith Skidmore will be highlighting some of the different aspects of multi-axis sensors. So to kick things off, Brian, why don't you give it a start here? All right. Well, thank you, Jamie, and thank you everybody for joining. Uh, we know time is uh, of the essence here, so we'll try to get through this quickly, but we do have uh, some time scheduled at the end for Q&A as well. So uh, I thought I'd start off by kind of reviewing force and torque sensors in general. Uh, those of you that are here obviously have some familiarity with those types of sensors. And as you know, most, mm -hmm. most of these He's sensors are going to be uh, bi-directional, right? So you'll have a, a signal output, positive, negative, usually for tension and compression or clockwise and counterclockwise applied torque if it's a, re if it's a torque sensor. Uh, however, both of those signals uh, are in the same axis of measurement. So um, other sensors can be had with uh, second or third redundant bridges. Those are usually called dual or triple bridge sensors. And those will have uh, basically duplicate bridges designed to measure the same axis of measurement. Um, those are used for maybe uh, control loops or redundancy for data act. Uh, however, those are still slightly different uh, than what we're going to be talking about today. And those are multi-axis. So multi-axis will essentially have uh, dedicated bridges to measure very specific loading directions. So a little bit different. Go ahead, Jamie. All right. So high level, what is a multi-axis sensor? Well, fundamentally, they share similar design and construction to most uh, strain gauge based transducers in that there's going to be Wheatstone bridges applied to various machined uh, components within the sensor. Uh, typically, it's referred to as a flexure. Uh, however, these are going to be uh, designed and implemented so that, again, they respond very specifically uh, to applied forces. Uh, and those forces could be in uh, many different um, directions. Uh, for example, uh, a lot of our sensors are going to be axial torque uh, or axial shear. Those are going to be some of our two and three axis sensors. So for axial torque, uh, you'd be talking about the FZ along with the MZ torsional value. Uh, for axial shear, that would be an FZ with the FX and FY shear components. And then some models will handle all six degrees in terms of uh, all three load axes as well as all three moment axes. They usually start life uh, as one of three different configurations. Uh, you're going to see axial sensors that have additional bridges added, whether it be for torsional or for moment measurement. Uh, and as you can imagine, those are primarily going to have uh, higher axial capacities for that particular uh, channel. Uh, with the other ones being usually slightly lower uh, in, in range. Uh, the next flavor would be a torsional load cell where we add axial or other types of bridges, such as our 5600 there on the right. Um, again, you can understand that you might have a little bit lower tension capability, for example, from that sensor. Um, in fact, in that case, we've highlighted there that that's a compression only. So that's something else to note is that uh, sometimes you end up with a situation where they're not fully bi-directional for the additional bridges. Uh, but the last type are going to be dedicated multi-axis designs. So these sensors start life uh, with the intent of being a multi-axis, and you're going to find usually more balanced 
capacities for the different bridges. Uh, and then from there, you're going to have either discrete uh, outputs for each axis, or you might have a situation uh, which is common for six axis sensors where you have uh, various signals coming out, but they're not already, uh, how do I put this? They're not discrete for the actual measurement axis. So I'll explain that in a little bit more detail here. So these are a couple of our 3A, 3-axis sensors. So both of these are designed to measure uh, FZ and FX and FY shear loads in addition to that axial. Uh, you can see on the left there uh, where you, we've exposed some of the machined elements uh, you can almost imagine that being three load cells uh, attached in a string uh, with the uh, load uh, load pad there in the center at the end of that string. So each each load cell in that three axis sensor, uh, excuse me, or each flexure uh, is, a, is aligned and will be gauged such that uh, it responds to that particular load. Uh, the one on the right uh, is a little different in that instead of it being uh, all sequential. Uh, it's designed with more symmetry uh, where we have the X, Y, and X, uh, excuse me, the FX and FY shear bridges uh, or flexures designed in such a manner that you have better symmetry uh, and more consistent loading there. But but again, um, this is where you would have three bridges uh, where each bridge, now joining. each bridge would provide a specific FZ, F, FX, FY, for example, uh, signal output. Now here's a cutaway of our six axis sensor, uh, which is uh, similar to, to most of these types of sensors on the market. And these you can see are a little bit different in that we have uh, essentially six bridges on the sensor. However, they're not aligned in any particular uh, force orientation. Uh, so these sensors rely on detailed calibrations where through that calibration process, you establish a coefficient matrix uh, which can then be used to uh, manipulate, shouldn't say manipulate, but adjust each channel output to determine what the discrete axis signal measurement is. Um, so these uh, these are nice in that you end up with a, a guaranteed symmetric loading condition uh, with uh, high stiffness typically and uh, symmetric and low deflection to that. Uh, the only caveat here is that you do need to implement uh, some math, which is typically done in the instrumentation. Uh, or we'll have to handle somewhere to be able to then interpret those six individual millivolt per volt signals. Mark. Is now exiting. So one thing we wanted to accomplish today is uh, to, to, get, uh, to get you thinking about some of your existing testing or upcoming testing. Uh, it's usually pretty straightforward when you know you're going to need uh, a multi-axis force or torque sensor to be able to handle a particular test. However, what we're finding is many of our customers are going back and taking a look at existing test applications and realizing they can gain quite a bit out of having the additional channel data. Um, oftentimes, uh, you know, you do your best to, to isolate load conditions, uh, but the reality is you may have other forces uh, transmitting through that particular test article. Uh, that can lead to a lot of complications, um, as you can imagine. So. Uh, again, we're finding more and more that it, it does not hurt to take a, a second look at existing test and and basically ask if if you would get more insight through additional channels. Some of the advantages, uh, you can essentially consolidate multiple sensors. Obviously, if you're using uh, different types of sensors in a particular test article, maybe you can consolidate, <laughs> save space, save mass. Surely, uh, by integrating everything joining. into uh, a particular sensor that has all channels built into it. Uh, you can you can measure and verify if there's any system level crosstalk in your test setup as well. Again, is there is there side loads you weren't aware of? Are you introducing bending moment uh, that you weren't aware of? Um, and for fatigue testing, that can play a big role uh, in in the actual um, service life of the of the article. Uh, you, you may you may have uh, impacted test data essentially. Uh, because the, the test maybe wasn't quite as pure as you thought it was from a force introduction standpoint. Uh, we're also finding many customers are looking at uh, the reaction side of, of a test article. Um, typically, there were assumptions made historically in terms of uh, you have your imparted forces to the test article and you assume what's transferring through and what's coming through on the other side. Uh, integrating multi-axis sensors allow you to verify that, so it improves your uh, model verification uh, as well as uh, significantly improving the test data you you obtain from from each test really. 
given that these are sometimes used in what I would call Harrier applications, uh, whether it be from a load introduction standpoint or uh, even geometrical standpoint, uh, make sure that you look at a couple aspects such as what what is going to be the actual force at the sensor face um, and how does that correlate to what a sensor is rated for uh, so that would apply to uh, safe overload um, ultimate limits potentially if you've got a dynamic or something where you may have a, a potential um, dynamic event uh, and then also allowable moments. Uh, most sensors are going to have that information. Multi most multi-axis sensors uh, will provide or you should expect to know allowable uh, moment values, for example, or torsional or overhung moments also, uh, depending on the type of sensor, uh, so that you can try to set up a uh, uh, test configuration to where not only do you ensure lowest error introduction, but you also ensure good sensor life. Um, and obvious rule of thumb, you know, look at whatever axis is most important to you and start there. Uh, start with whatever that primary axis might be and then look at uh, supplementing with the additional uh, bridges or uh, additional force vectors that you're looking to get. So I'm going to hand it over to Ken here. He's going to talk a little bit about our products. Hello, everyone. Yeah, I'm going to take you through some of the product offerings that we have. And um, uh, let's see, we'll move through uh, two axis, uh, starting with our um, X, TXY uh, product. Basically, this one here has a um, axis uh, in the X and Y. Uh, so it usually can uh, be measured uh, lateral forces, measures lateral forces. Uh, may be installed sideways in an application so it's narrow and fits into compact areas. And let's move to our next one. So these are axial torsion type units. So we've got uh, force in, uh, let's say, the Z direction or torsion uh, around that uh, Z. Uh, one thing that's uh, interesting about these type of products, there's uh, a number of different ones I'll take you through, is that ones that are initially designed for force will have a higher output in, let's say, the force direction and lower output in the torsion and vice versa. So just keep that in mind. Um, and uh, we'll show you uh, right here some of the product. The AT101 has basically five different uh, capacity combinations. Um, it uh, uh, works, of course, in the uh, force and torque directions, and the capacities are stated there. Uh, same thing with AT102 and AT103. Uh, those are flange styles, and they can do uh, compression and torque. Uh, now, when we look at the model 1216, uh, that one is based on an interface low profile uh, design. So you've got a flange mount. Um, and then you can, uh, you know, have the extraneous load resistance like uh, interface low profile designs have. So that's one of the advantages there. And uh, on the model 2816, now we're moving up into a, a higher capacity version of a flange style uh, axial torsion load cell. And um, Again, based on the interface low profile design, so it has the uh, extraneous load resistance. Uh, the model 1516 has a um, single capacity um, and it's a flange style. Um, the model uh, 5600 is based on a torque transducer design, so again, we'll have the higher output in the torsion direction. And then in this case, as Brian stated earlier, uh, only a compression direction with the torque. So the advantages of using these types of load cells is there's many capacities to choose from and a variety of different mounting options and sizes. So it gives you some versatility. Now we're moving to our three axis load cells. Uh, as Brian stated earlier, uh, you've got a um, three load cell type design, but with a lot of symmetry 
in it. So you've got uh, three full bridged outputs. Uh, so if you're used to working with, uh, you know, a regular millivolt per volt load cell, you can uh, basically operate each one of these bridges as a regular standalone output. It's a small size and you can have an IP68 option, which is active. The 5200 series is basically has a force in the Z and then moments. So like a windshield wiper over the top of the load cell. And uh, again, it based on the interface low profile design. It's simple mounting, a single hole in the top, a single hole in the bottom, and you get thrust and moment measurements uh, at the same time. Our six axis load cell, as Brian described earlier, um, is a product that uh, has a coefficient matrix. So if you remember the beams that he showed you, we have six independent beams in there that are full bridge um, output beams. And uh, the coefficient matrix uh, basically coordinates the uh, relationship between each axis and those beams, how they react to it. Uh, in some cases, in our lower capacity units, it's a 36 term uh, matrix. On our higher capacity units, it's a 72 term matrix. So some of the advantages are that more data is better. And uh, some of the things Keith will talk about, we'll explain that more, but sometimes you learn a lot by seeing what happens in six different axes as opposed to, let's say, three or one, uh, things you didn't know. Accuracy. Um, the product uh, with a standard calibration is uh, very good, let's say around a 1% system accuracy, but finer calibrations can be done uh, specific to the um, application that you're doing, and so that can make it even um, more accurate. Uh, it's cost effective and it's a very stiff product. So system solutions, we um, have the ability to take products like a, a axial torsion load cell and combine it with our SI USB, that's a two channel USB interface module and provide you with uh, this scaled together to work uh, right when you get it from uh, the get-go. Um, our model BSC4D, uh, same thing, it's a USB interface module. Uh, we can put that with our model 3AXX load cells and give you straight interface to your PC, giving you logging, graphing, uh, configuration. The BX8 is our eight-channel data ACK but it works perfectly with our six axis load cell. And what it does is it can do the coefficient, uh, matrix coefficient math internally. And so this makes it a very easy way to work with the six axis load cell. It sounds very complicated on the onset, but when you get a BX8, basically it's point and click, load the matrix, and the matrix math is already calculated internally and then provide scaled analog outputs uh, for you to work with to your system. And then we also have some multi-channel bridge amplifiers, um, just in case you want to take it and do all these uh, calculations or uh, inside your own data act. Um, our model INF4 will give you uh, digital outputs and our model BSC4A can give you um, analog. And these are like I say, multi-channel up to four channels. So why interface instrumentation? Well, one thing is that there's a lot of instruments to choose from. And so uh, interface can help you pick the right instrument that'll go with the product that you're using, the multi-axis product you're using. And then we can also take it to the next level and we can uh, scale them together and give you a cert if you need it. Um, we can help you with uh, options like TEDs. So that'll help you have uh, plug in your 
uh, actual torsion, let's say, product into a TEDS ready instrument and it'll automatically set up and then you could change it to a different one, a different load cell and the instrument would automatically set up with that. Also, we can uh, provide you with some wireless solutions. So we have a full line of wireless products and sometimes running wires throughout your plant or through your operation uh, can be cumbersome and hard to manage. And uh, our wireless product will work with all of this uh, product we showed you today and uh, reduce the amount of wires and set up in your, in your uh, factories. And then lastly, we've got a large offering now of digital products. And so a lot of companies are doing things with Ethernet. Multiple people are now exiting. And Profi Bus and those things. And we have instrumentation that can uh, connect your multi axis products directly to your networks. Now I'd like to turn it over to Keith, who's going to tell you a bit about some applications and use cases. Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending. Thank you, Ken. Um, applications, these are just to plant a seed. You know, these are fairly basic um, uh, ideas, but wind tunnel is one that comes up fairly frequently with us. Um, there are very complicated load uh, cells called wind tunnel balances that are used in wind tunnels. Um, but for a basic setup, a six axis sensor can be useful. You can measure lift and drag and yaw and you know the various components um, in the wind tunnel with a single sensor um, mounted. Um, you may put potentially underneath the uh, the test article. We have a specific version that has the ability to withstand large moments, but measure relatively low forces, and that's the kind of loading you end up with when you have a test article in an airstream or windstream with the sensors down, say, fairly far below it. So you have a large lever arm. And so large moments, you don't necessarily care about those moments, but you want the load cell to survive. Um, you don't want to size the sensor up so high that it can take the moments and then lose resolution on the uh, axes of interest. So that's somewhat interesting. Um, Air-based structural fatigue testing, and that really goes for any structural fatigue testing. Um, you're making assumptions. You may make assumptions that the loading is purely axial. Um, you may be right. You may be not. Um, our low-profile load cells are very good at rejecting errors to the eccentricity um, of load, but uh, your test specimen reacts differently, certainly if there's bending involved. And so a six axis or multi-axis sensor can tell you um, what those loads are. And then you can either adjust a test to you know, minimize them, or you may just uh, take them into account. Um, if you're doing, say, testing on uh, multiple test articles, you'd want to make sure that the uh, bending and the extraneous loading is the same um, between the tests so you can get apples to apples comparison um, and that goes when you're doing say computer uh, model validation if you're feeding data in you're making assumptions about the uh, end point uh, you know the constraints um, if they're incorrect then you may be feeding uh, um, incorrect information back into the simulation as you say you know garbage in garbage out so you're trying to fine tune a model and validate it it's good to know um, if you're, some of your assumptions are correct or if all of them are correct. Um, friction testing, we've got a number of customers who do various uh, methods of uh, rheometry, uh, measuring friction with spinning disks or rotating elements. Um, a spinning disk, you could use an axial torsion load cell. Um, if you're going to say press down on the surface and then slide across the surface, one of our three axis sensors could be used with just the FC and say the FX or FY. It's also useful to have the extra axes then to know if uh, you're not oriented properly. You might see that you're actually getting a lot more F say Y than you expect and that either means you've got a problem with the test or you know maybe your test article likes to squirm around a bit on the test surface. So it's definitely interesting to have the extra information although a typical test would really only measure say uh, normal load and then one um, shear. Moving on, uh, medical device testing is a very commonly uses multi axis sensors or multiple sensors in configuration so that you can measure multiple axes. Uh, the advantage of an actual multi axis sensor is a lot more compact package and trying to come up with some combination of multiple load cells to do the same thing. 
you can imagine um, ball joint or any kind of a, a medical prosthetic has a relatively complex range of motions. Typically, you never just one axis of force. And so if, say you're measuring the wear characteristics of a, a socket, you'd really want to you understand what the forces are and then you know be able to duplicate those in some kind of a long-term test so that you can study say the differences between different materials and whatnot but obviously if your test conditions aren't the same between different uh, types of specimens and really you don't know um, what was say causing uh, earlier wear out on one versus the other if you don't know for sure the loading conditions were the same um, Robots, uh, interesting application. There's lots of uh, things being done these days with robots, um, robotic arms. Um, Multi-axis sensors can go at the end of an arm and can be used to measure either weight or uh, forces applied during an operation. Um, they can also be used for, say, de collision detection. If an arm is moving around, you'd certainly want to know if it's getting ready to uh, impact something. Um, robots are very good at very precise measurement, but they're not necessarily that good at knowing uh, where they are. So if you're trying to come into contact with a test or an item or an object, um, force feedback um, can help make sure the robot doesn't uh, say move too far and uh, you know come into contact if you're not um, expecting that. Um, moving on. Um, hydrofoil, this is an interesting application we actually did with the Navy where they're studying the effects of a hydrofoil um, you know, in a wave tank. And we had some three axis sensors used and they basically measured the lift as the, uh, you know, the boat moves through the water. It starts to rise up on the hydrofoils and that uh, creates say an FZ load or an FX load in this case. And then they also wanna know how much drag and obviously the relationship between say speed, drag and lift was something that was interesting to them. And uh, these were water resistant versions of the sensor that were actually allowed you know, to be submerged and uh, survived quite well. Um, they do have to be uh, specially treated for that though. So not just a standard product. Um, seat testing is pretty interesting. You can imagine this is a pretty basic drawing of one, but there are somewhat complicated um, fixtures that are used to press against a seat. But you imagine if you're trying to validate or evaluate different seat designs, it really makes a difference how the fixture interfaces with the uh, the test article, especially as the test article wears. So you imagine in this example, you can see if you're pressing right against that seat and it had that, uh, you know, say feature right there in front of the fixture, as that starts to wear, you can imagine the load application point actually moves from being say on center to trying to create a, a bending moment. And um, that can be bad for the sensors, also creates errors, also creates situations where when you test, maybe the seat fails uh, earlier than expected to, but it really turns out the lever arm of your force application down Joe here. Joe DeVito was He's now joining. Um, you know, it wasn't what you expected. So then the next test, maybe with a different seat back, you know, the hinge lasts longer, but it's really because you were applying less of a lever arm and you didn't realize it because the foam, say, wore more quickly or the shape was slightly different. So very interesting um, to measure. And then, you know, once you know what's going on, you can either redesign the test such that it uh, say minimizes bending or, you know, try to make sure that the characteristics are the same when you run a different specimen to, uh, you know, apples to apples comparisons. Um, center of gravity, lots of systems, you say multiple load cells, say if you want to measure the center of gravity. Joe DeVito. Uh, plane. He's now exiting. You would have a um, you know system where you might have say three or four load cells beneath the surface, and then you could measure the uh, CG within that. Um, with a single multi-axis sensor approach, you can also do something similar, but it's um, could be done with more complicated geometry and done in uh, multiple axes. Um, moving on, um, this is somewhat interesting is that uh, you can make a plate system with multiple either single axis load cells or multiple multi-axis load cells and create a quite a large uh, system that can be used to measure loads whereas you might have difficulty say finding a single six axis sensor that was large enough to um, survive very large reaction loads due to say a big platform you can actually mount multiple three axis load cells at the corners and have quite a big platform. For example, you have a machine sitting on this base, say, or a robot. You know, if you want to know if the robot arm contacts something and starts to create a, uh, 
you know, a tip over, you could do that. Where a sensor at the very end of the arm only can tell you if the end of the arm is touching something. But if, say, the middle of the arm, right, there's no force feedback there. But a plate system like this could uh, allow you to sense that and recognize it. Um, also, lots of different analysis situations where you have a reaction load, where you have a fairly, say, large footprint. Something like this can be useful. Um, moving on, frequently asked questions. When it comes up fairly regularly with the six axis is, do I need to use a BX8? And the answer is, you don't need to, but we highly recommend it. And we say that, especially after we've worked with a number of customers who did not um, use one and are trying to do the instrumentation themselves. It's not that complicated, but in, in, in reality, it, it does complicate things pretty dramatically. Um, all multi, you know, all axes have to be sampled uh, simultaneously, and then their math performed to understand the actual axis output. So the BX8 does that. Um, also, you know, we do have software that comes with it that allows you to do the visualization, data logging, and all that. But one of the neat things about BX8 is you can set it up using software, and then you can um, disconnect the software, and it just sits there as a black box. But it runs the calculations internally and scales its own analog output. So instead of having a six signals that you have to deal with and figure out you know, what the actual axis loads are, the output from the VX8 is just say plus or minus 10 volts equals you know, FX, FY, FC. So it turns it into six discrete sensors, essentially. Um, the BSC4 is a four channel box that we use with our three axis sensor. Is that not as necessary? Because a three axis sensor is uh, three discrete axes basically but it certainly simplifies things you plug into one little box and you get your outputs from the box either as amplified voltages or as a, a usb connection to a pc um, another thing that comes up uh, fairly commonly is what if i need only four axes or five or three um well it depends you know we may have a you know a lower axis count sensor that has the uh, particular combination of axes you need um, or we may not, but a six axis sensor can measure all of the axes and you don't have to use all of the uh, data if you don't want to, but you do always need the six channels because the way they work, you can't get only four axes without still measuring all six channels of the sensor. So again, once you have the data too, you might find that you are interested in it. You know, you assume that there's say nothing going on in the F Y axis. Well. Once you start taking measurements, you might find there's a little more there than you expected. And then either you change your test set up to eliminate it, or you just, uh, you know, it's there and you can use that information appropriately. Um, next, do we offer customization? Absolutely. We uh, do special configurations and calibrations. Um, OEM special products such as for robotics or medical applications. Um, special calibrations are pretty interesting because the sensors are always optimized for, say, the most broad use case allowed. And so in a six axis sensor, you've got six axes, they're all rated for, you know, plus or minus a certain Newton meters or, you know, force or a torque value in each axis. But in a lot of cases, you may say that, oh, I'm only using the sensor down at, uh, you say, in compression only in the FC, and then I have small moment loads and I have a, a large FY load, for example. And if you do know those um, conditions, you don't have to know them exactly, but you know, okay, you're not going to be, you know, applying any tension load, for example. But we can optimize the calibration such that it fine tunes fine tunes the performance under those load conditions. You know, now maybe it doesn't work as well if you, you know, use it in the other direction, but we can uh, kind of move the calibration such that it optimizes it um, in your use case. Um, how do we best engage an application expert? Well, a phone call or an email is nice. What we like to do, though, is start to talk about uh, the geometry when you're talking about multi-axes. And so a sketch is always very useful. You know, a lot of times it's proprietary, so you, you may not want to provide all of the details. But what we want or need is something you know, quite basic, but where's the load cell? Where's the test article? What's the geometry, the distances, you, you know, approximately applied loads? Those kind of things we can start to understand you know make sure we get a large enough sensor to survive the measurements and also you know a small enough one to have enough resolution for those same uh, measurements next please all right so we're going to have a q a opportunity here 
So if you have a question, you can unmute your mic and as well, you can also use the chat window. And in fact, we've got a couple already for our team. Uh, first of all, Bill wants to know what's the time lag on the BX8 if you're feeding it into another DAC? Anybody got a recommendation on that? Oh, it's pretty fast. It's like um, four kilohertz, something like that. Um, the sample rate is, say, 48,000 samples per second synchronous. When you start running the math on the uh, coefficient matrix, so it knocks it down a bit. I think the limit is about, you know, four kilohertz for the, uh, the bandwidth pass through once you have all six axes and the calculations running. I, I more meant the time offset. Because was it the BX8 or was it a different model that I can feed into like a SOMAT, for instance? And I was wondering all the data coming in from accelerometers, I would want it to be as in sync as possible with the load cell results. Well, it's it's if you're talking about digital data, it's all packetized and the, the data is synchronized. So everything coming out of the BX, you know, all data packages include synchronous data. So if it's sampling them all, say in the same channels, they're all uh, synchronized in the data packet. Yeah, so I think the question is how long does it take to do the computing? That, that's a good question. Is this uh, is this Bill? Yes. All right. Um, we'll we'll look into it and get you an answer. That'd be great. Thanks. Sure. Mike wants to know: Does the BX8 provide the excitation to the sensors? Absolutely. And then we've got another question for a six-axis sensor: Is the calibration done axis by axis or by uh, or all axis simultaneously? Um, multiple axes simultaneously. So there would be a uh, force at an offset applied, which creates a combination of loads. So there's multiple combinations of loads applied during calibration. And he's got another specific question. Uh, in which cases do you have a 72 figures compensation matrix only on a six axis sensor with a double bridge? Yes. Is that is that true? That is true, but it's not truly a double bridge. It's 12 um, bridges and you're basically running a more complicated matrix calculation, but it still is not. It's basically an extra bridge per bridge to help error correction of the crosstalk. There's not like two like a load like a dual bridge load cells like two redundant signals with 12 bridge six axis. It's still a six axis. You get one single result for any uh, axis calculation, but there's a correction or a, a tuning or a, an improvement in the calculation is done by having a second bridge um, for each, say, channel calculation. We've got one from Derek. Is it possible or has someone successfully connected a three axis unit to an uh, Arduino? I don't know if I pronounced that right, right? A-R-D-U-I-N-O? Arduino. Yes, it is possible. Um, especially the three axis, it's just like three load cells. So if you can connect a single load cell to an Arduino, you can connect a three axis. I um, mean, you would need an amplifier typically between it and the Arduino. And most Arduinos have fairly low resolution on their uh, analog to digital converters. So you may, you know, want something that um, improves that resolution, including an Arduino based uh, add on A to D converter. But we have a lot of customers who are doing that these days. Yeah, I would just add, uh, you know, use caution in the uh, bridge bridge amplifiers. These are ratiometric sensors, so any noise that may come through on the supply side uh, will impact the signal. So um, quality of instrumentation is really important. That's great. Uh, Mark wants to know on the plate design, what is the largest amount it can handle in uh, MX? Well, Typically, these would be based on our uh, 3A series, three axis sensors. So the largest, um, say, X or Y load would be basically sort of four times the largest capacity minus some safety factor. So maybe divided by four again, just to make sure you're well within the working range of the load cells. Um, Ken Bishop can probably answer. I can't remember what the largest capacity. I think it's uh, 500 kilonewton or five, yeah, 500 kilonewton. So about a hundred thousand pounds ish. And you could say, okay, it's 400,000 because there's four sensors, but you'd want to back off of that 
um, for safety factor. Um, so the advantage really is that you can search this, you know, allow very large moments because you have a large plate and then the reaction points, you know, are out off the center line by, you know, as much as you need. So you start to react to very large moments without uh, killing the sensors. <laughs> Good point. Uh, Ron wants to know, using a BSC4DC with a three axis cell, can you send a command via VB to retrieve all three access values? For the BSC4? Yeah, the BSC4DC. No, that, I think it'll just stream the data, but you will get a single packet. But it doesn't store them until you ask for it. You can send a command that says read, and it'll send back a packet which has the three axes data in it. But it doesn't say accumulate them until you ask for it, and then it'll send you out multiple readings. Okay. And Ron, if you need more information on that, be sure to contact our technical team. Uh, Charles wants to know regarding application of multi-axis six sensor sensor application for underwater object hitting stones. What is a what is high speed capability for dynamic strike at, strike applications for strain gauge load cells? Is there another kind that can do or handle high impact loads? Very good question. And as they say, the devil's in the details, but these are very stiff. All of our multi axis sensors are quite stiff, which means they react to impacts as well as any of our sensors do. And many customers do use our, say, low profile load cells and others in impact testing. That said, um, impacts can create large loading you know, conditions and you know, so you have to be careful of the survivability of the sensor. And also, um, you know, there's a limit. They can only react so fast, but it's down in the millisecond range, typically. That's great. Uh, we don't have any more questions coming into the chat. Is there anything else you guys think would be useful and sharing today that uh, from these questions? No, I just uh, I just hope we we shed some light to uh, you know going back, taking a look at your applications, uh, rethinking how you're doing existing testing as well. Uh, and uh, give multi-access a shot on future applications. Uh, the accuracy is getting very good, and there's usually a place you can find to integrate these that will really complete the, the test picture. And just for resources, we do have online on our website brochures, our catalog uh, data sheets for every model so that as you begin to design uh, any test requirements, you can look at the specifications. And we've got some videos on setups on our YouTube channel and a lot of app notes. You saw some of the diagrams there, but we give you more detail on what the specific products were used and sometimes that can spark an idea or uh, a question. But our application engineers and technical library are here to assist. So be sure to reach out to us if you're evaluating uh, use or have questions like what we just answered for some of the people that are currently using products. Um, with that, I want to thank everyone for taking the time to join us today. We'll be posting this online on our YouTube channel and also sharing it to all participants, but uh, we'll be scheduling our next event on our Axial TQ product, um, and that will be scheduled in July, so hopefully we'll see you there. Thanks so much, everyone, and hope you have a great day.